بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد I welcome everyone back to the series of biographies of the eminent scholars of hadith in which we are covering the 18 biographies of the great imams of the Salaf, the great imams of hadith that Imam Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi rahimahullah has mentioned in his book Taqdimatul Ma'rifa bi Kitab al-Jarwa Ta'adil and we mentioned in our previous class that Imam Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi has divided the 18 Imams he has mentioned in this book into four tabaqat, four levels. We just finished our previous class with the first level, which included six Imams from the Imams of the senior Atba'u Tabi'in. We started with Imam Malik ibn Anas, the Imam of the region of Medina from the Atba'u Tabi'in. Then we moved on to Mecca and covered the biography of the Imam of the region of Mecca, Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Then we moved from Hijaz to the region of Iraq and covered the biography of Imam Sufyan ibn Sa'id al thawri the Imam of the region of Kufa. Then we moved to the city of Basra and covered Imams the biographies of the two Imams of this region, Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj and Hamad ibn Zaid. And we finished off with the Imam of the region of Asham, present day Syria and Lebanon and the countries in those in that area, Abdurrahman ibn Amr al-Awza'i, rahimahumullah jami'an. Today we will begin inshallah with the second level. Those students who came after this first level, the junior Atba'u Tabi'een, the Imams of the lesser level of the Atba'u Tabi'een, the junior level of the Atba'u Tabi'een in these areas, to whom the knowledge of the previous Imams that we just mentioned reached and they preserved it, safeguarded it, and then conveyed it to the Imams who came after them. We will study the biographies of two Imams today. One, the Imam of the region of Kufa from the junior Atba'u Tabi'een, Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah. Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah. And the second Imam whose biography we will cover today, inshallah, is the Imam of the region of Basra during the era of the junior Atba'u Tabi'een, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan. Yahya ibn Sa'id. Al Qattan. So we will start, inshallah, with the biography of the first Imam from the second level, whom Imam Ibn Abi Hatim al Razi has mentioned in his book Taqdimatul Marifa, and he is Imam Waqi' Ibn al Jarrah. Waqi' Ibn al Jarrah. His name is Abu Sufyan. This is his kunya, Abu Sufyan Waqi' Ibn al Jarrah, Ibn Mali, Ibn Mali al Ru'asi, al Ru'asi al Kufi. Al-Kufi from the city of Kufa in Iraq. He is the Imam, the Hafiz, the precise memorizer of the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhaddith al-Iraq. He is known as the Muhaddith, the scholar of Hadith of the region of Iraq. He is one of the well-known and one of the most famous scholars of Islam, Ahadul Alam. He is the Imam of the scholars of Kufa who came after him, and he is a Rawiyat Sufyan al Thawri. He is the student who conveyed to us the ahadith from the chain of narration of his teacher Sufyan al Thawri. The ahadith, the thousands of ahadith, as we mentioned in our previous class, the vast memory and precision of Sufyan al Thawri, and that if one were to compile his ahadith, then it would reach at least 10 volumes, as the scholars have mentioned. This vast number of ahadith, Imam Sufyan al thawri around whom the chains of narration of the Sunnah revolve, this knowledge, this, these ahadith, it came to be safeguarded and preserved by his foremost student, Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, in the region, in the city of Kufa. This is the trans 
this is how the knowledge of hadith transferred and this is how it progressed in the region of Kufa. Imam Sufyan al thawri from the major Atbaw Tabi'een, then he passed it on to his former student Waqi' ibn al Jarrah from the minor Atbaw al Tabi'een. As far as his date of birth, then he was born in the year 129 after the Hijrah. 129 after the Hijrah. He sought knowledge of hadith from a great number of the major scholars of the Salaf, major scholars of Hadith, major scholars of Islam, from them Hisham ibn Urwa and Al-Amash, Sulaiman ibn Mehran, Al-Amash, and Ismail ibn Abi Khalid, and Abdullah ibn Aun, and ibn Juraj, and Yunus ibn Abi Ishaq al-Sabi'i, and Al-Awza'i, and Misar ibn Kidam, and Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj, and other than them. These are from his great scholars who he studied the knowledge of hadith from. And as we just mentioned, the most foremost of them is Imam Sufyan al thawri the Imam of the region of Kufa in the era of the major, the senior Atbaw Tabi'een. Qasim ibn Yazid al-Jarmi, rahimahullah, he says, كان الثوري يدعو وكيعا وهو غلام فيقول يا رؤاسي تعال أي شيء سمعت فيقول حدثني فلان بكذا وسفيان يتبسم ويتعجب من حفظي that Imam Sufyan al-Thawri he used to call Waki ibn al-Jarrah when he was a young when he was a young man he was still a young man in his young age and he would say come here O Ruasi calling him by his family name or his ascription al Ruasi come here O Ruasi what did you hear today? What have you memorized from the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So Waki ibn al-Jarrah would start narrating the ahadith that he had memorized to his teacher Sufyan al thawri So Imam Sufyan al thawri upon hearing the precision and the memory of this young, young man, Waki ibn al-Jarrah, this young student of his, he would smile, he would smile out of his happiness for the great precision and memory that Waki ibn al-Jarrah possessed. Qala Yahya ibn Yaman, Yahya ibn Yaman, he says, Nazara Sufyan ila aynay waki' faqala la yamutu hadha ru'asi hatta yakuna lahu shan. That Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimullah, he looked at his student, Waki' ibn al-Jarrah, when he was a young, when he was a young boy, and he said that this, this ru'asi, calling him by his family name, Waki' ibn al-Jarrah, he will not pass away except that he will be from the major scholars of Islam. He will become well known to be one of the foundational scholars of Islam. This shows the great level that Imam Waki ibn al-Jarrah he reached from a young age. The great level in the science, the science of hadith and in the sciences of Islam, Imam Waki ibn al-Jarrah reached in the era of his major teachers at a young age due to his diligence and his exertion and his striving in this path. Al-Qa'nabi, rahimahullah, he says, Kunna inda Hamad ibn Zayd, falamma kharaja waki' qalu hadha rawiyatu Sufyan. Qala Hamad, in shi'tum qultu arjah min Sufyan. That Al-Qa'nabi, he says, we were in the gathering of Imam Hamad ibn Zayd, rahimahullah. So we saw waki' ibn al-Jarrah entering the gathering. So when Hamad ibn Zayd saw Waki'i, he said, Hadha rawiyah to Sufyan. This is the one from the, he is the foremost student of Sufyan, a thawri who has safeguarded and preserved the knowledge of hadith from him. And Hamad ibn Zayd continued by saying, and if I wanted to, I would have said that he is arjah min Sufyan. That he is more he has preserved the ahadith that Sufyan al thawri narrated even more precisely than Sufyan himself, than Sufyan himself. And this is just as Imam Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan rahimullah said regarding Sufyan al thawri that Sufyanu a'lamu bi hadith al-Amash min al-Amash. That Sufyan al thawri he is more knowledgeable and a precise memorizer of the hadith of Amash than Amash himself. Amash who is one of the foremost teachers and shuyukh of Sufyan al-Thawri, 
Sufyan's story reached such a level in memory and precision that he memorized and safeguarded the ahadith that Amish narrated to him better than Amish himself. Better than Amish himself. So similarly, Hamad ibn Zayd rahimullah says, similar is the situation of Waki ibn al-Jarrah, the student of Sufyan al-Thawri. He has memorized and preserved the hadith that Sufyan al-Thawri narrated even more precisely than Imam Sufyan al-Thawri. And what was the way and the means of this memorization that Waki ibn al-Jarrah reached? Yahya or Waki, he himself, he says, ما كتبت عن الثور قد كنت أتحفظ فإذا رجعت إلى المنزل كتبتها that this great precision that he reached in memorizing the knowledge of hadith on the authority of Imam Sufyan al-Thawri and the vast number of hadith that he memorized from him all of this by, was by way of heart Waqi ibn al-Jarrah had preserved this, memorized this by way of heart he says that I never used to write Anything I heard from Imam Sufyan al thawri in his gatherings, when we used to attend his gatherings where he would narrate a hadith, I would never write anything on his authority. Rather, I used to memorize by heart. I used to memorize what I heard by heart. And if I were to return at the end of, day, uh, the end of the day to my house, to my residence, then I would write it. Then I would write it from what I had memorized by heart. Such was the precision and the skill of memorization that Allah Ta'ala had blessed Imam Waqi ibn al-Jarrah with. Yahya ibn Yaman, he says, Lama mata Sufyan al-Thawri, jalasa waqi'un mudi'ahu. That Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, rahimahullah, he reached such a high pinnacle and status in this science, the science of hadith, gathering and compiling the ahadith that Imam Sufyan al-Thawri had in his memory and position and that he narrated to a point that after Sufyan al thawri he passed away in the year, as we mentioned in a previous class, 161 after the Hijrah, Imam Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, he sat in his position. He sat in his position in the city of Kufa. This knowledge of hadith, it transferred and it progressed from Imam Sufyan al thawri the Imam of the major, the senior Atbaw Tabi'in in Kufa, to his foremost student Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, in the city of Kufa. Imam al Zahabi, Rahimullah, he says, Asahu is Nadin bil Iraq, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and Waki, and Sufyan al Thawri, and Mansur ibn al Mu'tamir, and Ibrahim al Nahai, and Al Qama, and Abdullah ibn Masood, and in Nabi, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam al Zahabi says that the most authentic is Nad, the most authentic chain of narration in the region of Iraq, especially in the city of Kufa, is this chain that has been narrated by the major scholars of Islam, the utmost reliable narrators of hadith in the city and the region of Iraq and Kufa. The, the chain is that which has been narrated by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal on the authority of Waqi', on the authority of Sufyan al thawri on the authority of Mansur ibn al-Mu'tamir, on the authority of Ibrahim al nahai on the authority of al qama on the authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, and he narrates on the authority of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then we move on to the students of this great Imam, Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah, and as the previous Imams, we see that some of his own teachers and scholars have narrated hadith from him due to the high status he reached in the science and him striving and exerting in memorizing and safeguarding and collecting a hadith that even they did not have in their possession. So we see that his own foremost teacher and Sheikh Sufyan al thawri he narrated some ahadith from his student Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah. There's another reason that some of the scholars would narrate from their students. This was a way from them to give a taskia, a praise and a certificate of authenticity to their students to raise their in rank, to raise their rank and to make the people accept their position in this science. From that is that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he has narrated a hadith 
on the authority of his student, from one of his foremost students, Imam Al-Tirmidhi. Imam Al-Tirmidhi, it is well known, he's from the foremost students of Imam Al-Bukhari. But Imam Al-Bukhari himself has narrated a hadith on Imam Al-Tirmidhi. And Imam Al-Tirmidhi, he used to be extremely happy and pleased with this. And he used to always mention it by saying, هذا رواه عني Muhammad ibn Ismail. Whenever he would narrate this hadith, he would, he would boast and he would be happy with pride that this hadith has been narrated upon me by my teacher and Shaykh Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. So this was also one of the means that the scholars of hadith utilize to give a praise to one of their students and to raise him in rank by narrating a hadith on his authority when they saw that he had reached the utmost reliability in this science and precision. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak also who is older than Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, he has also narrated a hadith from him. He is also from his students. From his students is Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi who is his contemporary, who is his contemporary and as we will find soon, inshallah, they passed away in the same year. Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, this great Imam, he has also narrated a hadith from Waqi ibn al-Jarrah. He is from his students. From the students of Imam Waqi ibn al-Jarrah is Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and Ali ibn al-Madini, and Yahya ibn Ma'in, and Ishaq ibn Rahuya, and Ibn Abi Shayba, and Al-Humaydi, and Al-Qa'nabi, and Musaddad, and other major scholars from the scholars of hadith. Then we move on to the statements of the scholars of Islam and especially the scholars of Hadith regarding the position and status of Imam Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, especially in Hadith and his sciences. Marwan ibn Muhammad al-Tatari, he says, ma wusifa li ahadun qat illa ra'aytuhu dun al-sifa illa waqi'an ra'aytuhu fawqa ma wusifa li. That he said, whoever has been described to me from the scholars. The scholars, someone would describe to me that he possesses such and such knowledge and he has reached such and such status and he knows such and such. He says, whoever was described to me, then when I met that scholar, when I saw that scholar, I found him to be lesser than what was described to me. That what was described to me was something that was additional to what he truly possessed, the knowledge that he truly possessed, except for Imam Waqi, except for one scholar and he was Waqi. When I saw Waqi, when I met him, I found him to be even higher in knowledge than what was described to me. He was the only scholar I found to be even higher and better than what was conveyed to me and related to me before I met him and saw him. Jarir, he says, Ja'ani ibn al-Mubarak, فَقُلْتُ لَهُ يَا أَبَا عَبْدَ الرَّحْمَانِ مَنْ رَجُلْ الْكُوفَ الْيَوْمِ فَسَكَتَ عَنِّي ثُمَّ قَالْ رَجُلَ الْمِسْرَيْنِ وَكِيعِ That he says, Jarir, that Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, he came to me, so I told him, Ya Aba Abdul Rahman, he called him by his kunya, O Aba Abdul Rahman, who is the scholar of Kufa today? Who is the one who one should refer to in the science of hadith? So he remained quiet for a little while. Then he said that not just Kufa, Rajul al Misrain, the two major centers of hadith and his sciences in that time in Iraq, Kufa and Basra, the scholar of these two major centers of hadith is Waqi. Is Waqi. Imam Abdul Razak al Sanani, Rahimullah, he says, Ra'aytu al Sawri wa ibn Uyayna wa Ma'amaran. وَمَالِكًا وَرَأَيْتُ وَرَأَيْتُ فَمَا رَأَيْتُ فَمَا رَأَيْتْ عَيْنَيَّا قَدْ مِثْلُ وَكِيعٍ He says that Abdul Razak al-San'ani, Rahimullah, the author of the book, Al-Musannaf, he says, I saw and I met and I gained the knowledge of hadith and I sought the knowledge of hadith from major scholars such as Sufyan al-Sawri and Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Ma'amar ibn Rashid and Malik ibn Anas, وَرَأَيْتُ وَرَأَيْتُ And I saw similar scholars and other than them, وَفَمَا رَأَتْ عَيْنَيَّا قَتْ مِثْلُ وَكِي But my eyes never laid eyes on anyone who was similar to Waqi'i, who was similar to Waqi'i. 
he compared Imam Waki with these great major Imams from the major senior Atbaw Tabi'in and said that I never met anyone who resembled and who was close to Imam Waki. And Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the Imam of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, he used to greatly praise Waki and hold him in high regard, extremely high regard. He has several statements in praise of this great Imam Waki ibn al Jarrah. One of, from, from some of these statements, he says, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Rahimullah, Ma ra'aytu qat mithal waki fil ilm wal hiv wal isnad wal abwab ma khushu'in wa wara. He says that I have not seen anyone resemble and come close to waki ibn al Jarrah in knowledge and in memory and precision of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and in isnad, in knowing the authentic from the unauthentic and knowing the narratives of hadith and abwab and knowing the jurisprudence that is derived from the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in addition to all of this, this knowledge and this precision and memory and knowledge of the isnad and the fiqh and the matan, he had khushu and wara. He was someone who had extreme piety and he, was, he, was, he, had someone, he was someone who feared Allah Azza wa Jal. Imam al Zahabi, when he narrated the statement of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his great book, Seer Alam al Nubala, he says, Yaqulu haza Ahmad mahatahari wa wara wa kashahada al kibar misal Hushem wa ibn Ayayna wa Yahya al Qattanu wa Abu Yusuf al Qadi wa amthalihim. Imam al Zahabi, he says that Imam Ahmad is saying this. And one should take into account his precision in making such statements and ruling upon, upon scholars and the narrators of hadith and his, uh, and his piety in making such statements. And Imam Ahmad has said that he has never seen anyone resemble and come close to Waki in these aspects. And he saw major scholars such as Hushem and Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Yahya ibn Sayyid al-Qattan and Abu Yusuf, al-Qadi Abu Yusuf from the students of Imam Abu Hanifa and, and scholars other than them. Ali ibn Uthman al-Nufayli, he says, Qultu li Ahmad ibn Hanbal, inna aba, aba Qatada yatakallam fi waki ibn al-Jarrah wa Isa ibn Yunus wa ibn al-Mubarak faqala man kathaba ahl al-Sidqi fahuwa al-Kathab. Imam Ahmad was told by Ali ibn Uthman al-Nufayli that Abu Qatada, Abu Qatada, this is a extremely weak narrator of hadith. Extremely weak narrator of hadith. His name is Abdullah ibn Waqid. Abu Qatada, Abdullah ibn Waqid al-Harrani. Al-Harrani, the scholars have ruled upon him to be matruk. Matruk meaning an extremely weak narrator of hadith. And he's muttafaq ala da'fihi. The scholars have unanimously agreed and united regarding his weakness. So, it was told to Imam Ahmad that this narrator Abu Qatada, he speaks ill of Waki ibn al-Jarrah and Isa ibn Yunus and Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, three great Imams of that times. So Imam Ahmad, he said, Man kathaba ahl al-sidqi fahu al -kathab. The one who speaks ill and who, who deems the people of truth and the people of reliability, the utmost precise memorizers of the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu the trustworthy narrators, who deems them to be liars and untrustworthy, then he himself is a liar. He himself is untrustworthy, he's a kathab. And this shows the methodology of the great scholars of the Salaf in ruling upon people by way of their association and companionship and ascription and who they sit with, who they mingle with, who they love. And we have mentioned several statements in the past of the great Imams that this is their methodology. They would say, if you see so-and-so loving the great scholars of the Salaf, such as Imam Waqi' here and other than them, then know that he's a person on the correct guidance. He's from Ahlul Hadith, he's from Ahlul Sunnah, he's from the safe sect and the aided group. And if you see someone speaking ill of them and ridiculing them and mocking them, then know that he's a person of innovation. Know that he's a person of misguidance. And Imam Ahmad says here, he's a kathab, he's a liar, he's untrustworthy. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimullah also says regarding Imam Waki, Kana Waki'un Imam al Muslimin fi Zamani. That Waki ibn al Jarrah, he was the Imam, the, the foremost scholar of the Muslims in his times, in his times, in the time of the junior Atba Uttabi'in. After we finish 
mentioning some of the prayers of the great scholars of Islam and the scholars of Hadith on the high stature and status of Imam Waqi'i, we move on to look at some aspects of his life that we can benefit from and uh, take as an example. Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya, rahimahullah, he says, Hifdi wa hifdu ibn al-Mubarak takalluf wa hifdu waki asli qama waki fastanada wa haddatha bi sab'amiyati hadithin hifdhan. That Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya, he says, that my memorization, the skill, that I had been given to memorize and the skill that Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak has been given to memorize, then it is something that we have strove hard and we have uh, labored after and we have, uh, we have struggled after to reach this level. As far as the hifz, the precision and memory that Imam Waqi possesses, then it is something that was given to him by Allah Azza wa Jal. It is something that is the foundation, the foundation that Allah Ta'ala had blessed him with. And he says, to show the great memory of this Imam Waqi, he says, we saw one day that Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, he took or he reclined towards a pillar. He reclines towards a pillar in a masjid or in one of the gatherings, he reclined, reclined towards a pillar and he narrated 700 ahadith from his memory. He narrated 700 ahadith from his memory by heart alone. Ibn Ammar, rahimahullah, he says, سَمَعْتُ وَكِيًّا يَقُولْ مَا نَظَرْتُ فِي كِتَابٍ مُنذُ خَمْسَ عَشَرَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا فِي صَحِيفَةٍ يَوْمًا That this memory of Imam Waki to show the great level and precision of this memory, this memory by heart, Ibn Ammar, he says that Imam Waki himself said that I have never revised a hadith in the books, in the scrolls in which I had written a hadith for the last 15 years. I had no need, I never needed to revise a hadith in any book and scroll for the last 15 years except for, for one day when I referred back to a scroll. Except for one day when I referred back to a score. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ عَدُّ عَلَيْكَ بِالْبَسْرَةَ أَرْبَعَةَ أَحَدِيثَ غَلِطَ فِيهَا قَالَ وَحَدَّثْتُهُمْ بِعَبَّادَانْ بِنَحْوٍ مِنْ أَلْفٍ وَخَمْسِمِيَةَ أَرْبَعَةُ أَحَدِيثَ لَيْسَتْ بِكَثْرَةَ فِي ذَلِكَ That when Ibn Ammar, rahimahullah, he heard this statement from Waqi' he says that the scholars of Hadith, the, the major scholars of Hadith, they have caught Five, four errors that you committed in narrating hadith in the city of Basra. When you were in the city of Basra and you narrated a hadith, they caught that you made a mistake in four a hadith. Four a hadith that you narrated from your memory. So Waki, he responds to Ibn Ammar by saying, and I narrated in the city of Abadan, which is a city in present day Iran. He says, I narrated in the city of Abadan with almost 150,000 150, ahadith, 150,000 ahadith, so making a mistake in four ahadith is not something great, it's not something major. And this allows us to benefit that no one after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the scholars of this Islamic nation is free from mistakes. There's no one who is free, ma'asuman al-khata, who is free from mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Even the most precise memorizers and the utmost reliable narrators of hadith from these great imams around whom the chains of narration of the sunnah revolve and who have memor memorized and preserved the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. even them, the most precise of these narrators, the most trustworthy of them, they made mistakes. They made mistakes. The, the utmost Thiqat narrators, the utmost reliable narrators, they are those who commit the, the rarest of mistakes. Akhta'uhum nadira. Their mistakes are extremely rare. Their mistakes are extremely rare. It does not mean in any way that they are free from mistakes and they have committed no mistakes. But they are thiqat. They are the utmost reliable narrators of hadith because they, their mistakes are extremely few. Nadir, extremely few. 
As for the one whose mistakes are more, as for the one whose mistakes are more, then he, he is diminished in his precision and in his reliability in memorization from thiqa to the level of saduq, to the level of saduq, uh, to someone whose hadith is hasan, it is not sahih. And if his, if, if his mistakes even increase more to a point that his mistakes and his errors are close to one another, then he enters the, the various levels of being a da'if. Uh, various levels of being being a weak narrator of hadith being a weak narrator of hadith this allows us to understand the great precision and memory that Imam Waqir possessed that in 150,000 ahadith that he narrated by heart he, mis he made a mistake in only four ahadith only four ahadith the scholars of hadith only caught four mistakes from him which is like a drop in an ocean Abu Ubaid al-Ajurri rahimullah he says Su'ila Abu Dawood, ayyuma ahfaz, waki'un aw Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. Qala waki'un ahfaz, wa Abdurrahman atqan, wa qadil taqaya ba'da al-isha fi al-masjid al-haram, fa tawaqafa hatta sami'a adhan al-subh. That he says that Imam Abu Dawood, from the foremost students of Imam Abu Dawood is Abu Ubaid al-Ajurri, he says, my Shaykh and teacher in the gathering of Imam Abu Dawood, so he was asked this question that who is the higher level in precision and memory between these two narrators, Waqi and Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, who is of a higher level in precision and memory of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, between Waqi and Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. So he answered Imam Abu Dawood by saying that Waqi on Ahfad, that Waqi in the, in the quantity of a hadith that he has memorized with precision, then he is more, then he is higher than Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. Wa Abdurrahman atqan, that Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, even though the quantity of hadith he had memorized are less than Imam Waqi, but his memory, his precision is higher in those hadith. His precision and, and, and precision is higher in those hadith. And he said that I saw that both Waqi and Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, they met after Isha, after the prayer of Isha in, in Mecca, in Masjid al-Haram, in Masjid al-Haram, so they stood revising and reviewing a hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that they had memorized and possessed by heart. They started reviewing them and revising them. Hatta sami'a adhan subh And they did not depart one another, standing and reviewing and revising from Salatul Isha until the adhan of Fajr. Until the Adhan of Fajr, they were standing, revising and, re re revising and reviewing the Ahadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mahmud ibn Adam, rahimahullah, he says, Tadakara Bishr ibn Sari wa waki'un layla wa ana arahuma min al-isha ila subh Fakultu li Bishr, kayfa ra'aytahu? Qala ma ra'aytu ahfadha minhu. That, Mahmud ibn Adam, he says, that Bishr ibn Sari and waki' they got together and they started to revise the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and I witnessed this revision this gathering of revision and, and reviewing that occurred between Bishr ibn Sari and Waqi from Isha until Fajr from Isha until Fajr the entire night so when, when Fajr occurred and they left they exited this, this gathering of revision he said I asked Bishr ibn Sari how did you find Waqi? How did you find Waqi in his precision and his memory? Fakala ma ra'aytu ahfaza minhu. That he said, I, did, I have not seen anyone more precise and a, and a greater memorizer than Waqi. He had just an, exited this gathering, reviewing a hadith with Waqi from Isha until Fajr. And he said, that I have not found, I have not seen anyone more precise and a greater memorizer than Waqi. Ali ibn Khashram rahimullah he says ma ra'aytu bi yad waqi kitaban qat inna ma huwa hifz fa sa'altuhu an adwiyat al hifz fa qala in 'allamtuka al dawa ista'amaltahu Ali ibn Hashram Khashram rahimullah he says that i never saw a book a scroll in the hand of imam waqi ever inna ma huwa hifz rather his memorization was memory by heart dubbed as sadr his memorization of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was memory by heart. I never saw a book in his hand. So I asked him for the secret of this memory. I asked him 
for the secret and the medicine, the, re the, the medicine of this memory. So he told Ali ibn Khashram, he said, if I were to inform you this secret, if I were to inform you this medicine, will you take it? Will you use it? Qultu e wallah. Qala tarkul ma'asi ma jarrabtu mithlahu lil hifz. So Ali ibn Khashram, he said, upon being asked if he will, if he will use this medicine and if he will act upon this secret, he said, yes, by Allah, if you inform me, I will use it and I will act upon it. So Imam Waqi informed him the secret that it is tarkul ma'asi, to leave off sinning of Allah Azza wa Jal, to leave off sinning. Ma jarrabtu mithlahu lil hifz. And Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, he says that I have not found anything similar to leaving off sins in increasing and strengthening one's memory and precision. One's memory and precision. And this is the advice of Imam Waqi to all of his students, all of the students of Hadith who used to attend this gathering. If they were to ask him the secret to his great precision and memory, he would advise him and direct them to this secret which is to leave off the sinning of Allah Azza wa Jal. From that is this two lines of poetry, two lines of prose that is well known on, on Imam Shafi'i Rahimullah. He says, Shakawtu ila waki'in suwa hifzi fa arshadani ila tarkil ma'asi wa akhbarani bi anna al-ilma nurun wa nurullahi la yu'ta li'asi. That Imam Shafi'i he says that I complained to Imam al waki my deficiency in memorization when it became well known in that times that Imam Waqi is the most precise memorizer and the highest level uh, possess the highest level of memory the people they flock to him to find out, find out the secret the, his secret to reach this level from them was Imam Shafi'i he says I complain to Waqi my deficiency in memory and my weakness in my memorization so he directed me to the secret which is to leave off sinning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he informed me that knowledge the knowledge of hadith it is light and guidance from Allah azza wa jal that this light and guidance from Allah azza wa jal he does not give it to the one who is a sinner who is disobedient to him, who is disobedient to him. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimullah, mentioning the great precision and memory of Imam Waqi, he says, Kana waki'un hafizan hafizan ma ra'aytu mithlahu. He says that Imam Waqi, he was not just a hafiz, a precise memorizer. He was hafizun hafiz. He was double the precise memorizer double in his in his in his in his status in memorization of the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu he said i didn't see anyone close to him in this regard i did not see anyone who resembled him in this regard yahya ibn ma'in rahimullah he says wallahi ma ra'aytu ahadan yuhaddithu yuhaddithu lillah ghayr waki' wa ma ra'aytu rajulan ahfadha min waki' wa waki'un fi zamanihi kal awza'i fi zamanih yahya ibn ma'in he says that by allah I did not see anyone who narrated hadith, who related and taught hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu for the sake of Allah except for Waqi. And I did not see anyone who was a greater memorizer and in his precision, greater in precision than Waqi. And Waqi in his time and in his era was like Imam Al-Awza'i in his time and his era. Waqi in his time was similar to Imam Al-Awza'i in his era and time. Here we want to focus on the first part of Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in. He says that by Allah, ma ra'aytu ahadan yuhaddithu lillah ghayr waki. That I have not seen anyone who narrated a hadith, who taught a hadith, who related and narrated, conveyed a hadith for the sake of Allah except waki. Except waki. Here we have a very important point to discuss that the scholars of hadith have discussed in the books of Mustala al-Hadith in the books of the sciences of hadith which is the issue of taking money and a monetary payment for narrating hadith taking money and a payment for narrating hadith for narrating hadith 
is such a narrator's hadith the one who takes money for narrating hadith if his narration is to be accepted or it is to be rejected if his narration is to be accepted or it is to be rejected some of the scholars of hadith they had disliked the taking of money over the narration of the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam from them is imam ishaq ibn rahuya he su'ila anil muhaddith yuhaddithu bil ajr faqala la yuktabu anhu that imam ishaq ibn rahuya he was asked regarding the the narrator of hadith the scholar of hadith who narrates a hadith who teaches a hadith in return for a monetary payment in return for money in return for a payment so he said la yuktabu anhu that his hadith that he is narrating in return for a payment then his ahadith are not to be written his ahadith are not to be written and imam ahmad ibn hanbal and abu hatim al razi they also held a similar position to imam ishaq ibn rahuya that the one who narrates a hadith in return for a payment then his hadith is not to be written they discourage and dislike this action and the reason for this is that this is something that is disliked and frowned upon by the people and the community this is something that is makhroom al muruwa the narrator of hadith he has to be as we have mentioned in our previous classes he has to fulfill two conditions in order for his hadith to be accepted for his ahadith and his narration to be accepted he has to be adlun dabit he has to be al adl al dabit he has to be trustworthy in his religion and he has to be a precise memorizer of the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the adl adala his trustworthiness the trustworthiness of a narrator has five five clauses or five conditions the definition of al adl is al muslim al baligh al aqil al salim min asbab al fisq wa khawarim al murwa these five conditions have to be fulfilled in order for a narrator to be ruled upon to be adl to be trustworthy what are these five conditions that he has to be a muslim he has to be a muslim secondly he has to be of age someone who has reached puberty thirdly he has to have a sound intellect he has, he cannot be deficient in his intellect fourthly he has to be free from the causes and means of sinning the means of sinning the and the fifth the last clause and the last condition as salimum min khawarim al murwa and he has to be free from those matters that even though they are not impermissible even though they are not haram they are not impermissible in islam but the people the community they look down upon them they frown upon them and the scholars of hadith they place this condition to raise the rank of the student of hadith to show him how he should differentiate himself from the people he should not just be like the lame in general people he possesses the knowledge of the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he should be an example for the people he should be someone who should take care and look of after his actions and his interactions from the from the things that have been mentioned as those things that have been looked down by the people that the people frown upon that it is not befitting for a scholar of hadith for a narrator of hadith for a student of hadith to indulge in is for example eating in public eating is public the scholars of hadith have mentioned this in in the books of mustalah that this might be considered makhroom al khawa min khawarim al murwa something that is looked down something that is disliked by the people from from the examples that the scholars of hadith have mentioned in those times was wearing specific color of clothing specific color of clothing that the people they did not deem appropriate for a scholar of hadith to to wear from those issues are this issue that we are discussing the issue of taking a payment taking a payment on the narration of the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as we mentioned this has been mentioned by some of the scholars as to be something that the people they look down upon frown upon that a scholar he does not teach he does not convey the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam except if he is paid even though this is not something that is haram 
even though this is not something that Allah Ta'ala has forbidden. The proof of that is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma that has been narrated by Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih that the Prophet Sallallahu he said anna inna ahaqqa ma akhathtum alayhi ajran kitabullah that the most deserving and the most honorable of things that you can take a payment for is the book of Allah meaning teaching the book of Allah teaching the book of Allah conveying the book of Allah so the scholars, they have unanimously agreed that taking payment for teaching, for teaching the Quran and the Sunnah, this is not something that is haram. This is not something that is impermissible for, due to this hadith and there are other uh, proofs such as when Allah Ta'ala has allowed in the Quran for the one who has made, been made responsible over the orphan, over the wealth of an orphan, Allah Ta'ala has deemed it permissible for him to eat, to use from his wealth that which he needs. If he's poor, if this uh, supervisor of the wealth of the orphan, if he's poor and he does not have that which he can survive off and sustain himself with, then it is permissible for him to eat and take from the wealth of this orphan to his need, according to his need. So all of this, the scholars of Hadith have mentioned as proofs to this matter of taking a payment or a narration of a hadith of Prophet Muhammad uh, to not be something impermissible, but the people, they look down upon, they frown upon it. So it is better, it is deserving, it is better that a scholar of hadith, he refrains from it, if he's able, if he's able. But no, none of the scholars of hadith, they have criticized the narrators of hadith based on the fact that he took a payment for the narration of hadith. None of the scholars of hadith, they criticized and they questioned the, the, the trustworthiness of a narrator of hadith or diminished it because he took payment for the narration of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it has been narrated on several major scholars of hadith that they used to take payment. They used to take payment because this was the only way and means of them to survive. They had no other means of survival and supporting their families except by taking payment over teaching and relaying and conveying the hadith of Prophet Muhammad From them, as the scholars have mentioned in the books of Mustalah, is the great Imam Abu Nu'aym Al-Fadl ibn Dukain. Abu Nu'aym Al-Fadl ibn Dukain. He is one of the major teachers and scholars of Imam Al-Bukhari. Imam Al-Bukhari, he used to take a payment over the narration of hadith. From them is Ali ibn Abdul Aziz al baghawi Ali ibn Abdul Aziz and al baghawi And other than them, it has come that they used to take payment over the narration of hadith. And when we look into the biographies of these scholars, we find that they lived in the most, most difficult of situations. And they had no means to survive themselves and to support their families except by way of these payments, except by way of these Payments. It has been mentioned in the biography of Abu Nu'aym Al-Fadl ibn Dukain that he had several daughters. He had several daughters and he did not have that which would suffice them. He had devoted his whole life to studying and to teaching the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So he did not have that which he could support them by. So he used to take a payment for that reason to support his daughters. It has been mentioned on Ali ibn Abdul Aziz al baghawi that he also had daughters who were unmarried. And it has been mentioned in his biography that one of his daughters reached the age of 60 years. 60 years and she, he, she, he could never marry her off because of his hard, difficult situation and devotion to the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had gotten old and he had no means of, of taking care of these daughters except by way of charging and taking money over the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From the ones who it has been mentioned that he used to take a payment of over the narration of hadith is the great Imam Al-Harith Al ibn Abi Usama. Al-Harith ibn Abi Usama, he has authored a great book, Al-Musnad. Musnad Al-Harith. Musnad Al-Harith, which is well known and Alhamdulillah it is published amongst us today. It is mentioned that he used to take a payment over the narration of hadith. Imam Al-Zahabi, when he spoke 
about this great Imam al Haris ibn Abi Osama, he says, Wasakahu Ibrahim al Harbi, ma ilmihi bi annahu yahu the darahim. Wa Abu Hatim ibn Hibban, wa kalad darukutni, saduk, wa ma akhsa darahim ala riwaya, fakana fakiran, kathir al banat. Imam al Zahabi he says that Ibrahim al Harbi, he has deemed al Haris ibn Abi Osama to be thika, to be a reliable narrator of hadith, even though he knew that he took money and payment for the narration of hadith. He ruled upon him to be thika, to be reliable and trustworthy, and his hadith to be authentic, even though he knew that he took money over the relaying and the teaching of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And similar is the case of Ibn Hibban. He also ruled him, ruled upon him to be thika, to be trustworthy and reliable. And they said, as for him taking payment, over the narration of hadith, then he was faqir. Kana faqiran kathir al banat. Then he was poor. He, had, he was poor, he did not have that which would suffice him, and he had a lot of daughters. He had a lot of daughters who he needed to feed and take care of. Regarding Ali bin Abdul Aziz al Baghavi, who we just mentioned, he used to take payment. Imam al Zahabi, he says, Thiqa lakinnahu yatlubu ala tahdith wa yu'tazar bi annahu muhtaj. That Imam Az Zahabi says he is thika. He is the utmost reliable narrator of hadith, but he is to take a payment over the narration of hadith. And we, his excuse was we make an excuse that he was annahu muhtaj, that he was in need. He was someone who's needy, who needed to take this payment. As we mentioned, he had daughters also, that some of them had reached an old age that he could not now support. And it, as we mentioned, these are just some examples. It has been established on a lot of the narrators of hadith that they used to take a payment over the narration of hadith and no one from the scholars of al jarwa Ta'adil from the science of criticizing and praising the narrators they left off their narration or criticized them or diminished their trustworthiness or deemed them to be untrustworthy because of them taking this payment but as we mentioned it has been mentioned some, from something that is makhroom al muruwa that the people they look down upon and frown and it is better it is it is more deserving it is better that a scholar of hadith he refrains from doing so this is the explanation of the statement of imam yahya ibn ma'in that i did not see anyone who taught hadith and who narrated hadith for the sake of allah except waqi except waqi because waqi ibn al jarrah he did not used to take a payment over the narration of Hadith over the narration of hadith. And why was this? Why was he able to not take a payment over the narration of hadith? It has been mentioned in his biography that his father, Al Jarrah ibn Mali al Ruasi, Rahimullah, his father was the head and he was the one who was responsible over the Baytul Mal in the city of Kufa. The Baytul Mal where the zakat of the Muslims used to be collected. He was appointed by the governor of Kufa, the city of Kufa, to be, to be uh, someone who is responsible over this Baytul Mal. So Imam Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, he had vast resources in which he was born with, uh, financial resources that allowed him, uh, and his situation allowed for him to refrain from taking payment over the narration of hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam we continue by mentioning some of the life instances of this great imam waqi ibn al-jarrah from which we can take uh, lessons and benefits from them is that mahmud ibn ghailan rahimullah he says qala li waqi ikhtalaftu ila al-amash sinin he says that Waki, he told me that I continued to, to go to Imam Al Amish and hear hadith from him and study hadith with him and memorize uh, a hadith from him for a long period of years, for several years. This shows the diligence, the exertion of these Imams in gathering the hadith of Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, in preserving it, in safeguarding it. Imam Amish is the Imam of Kufa, of the Tabi'in, Suleiman ibn Mihran al-Amash, Imam Waki, he said, I used to go to him, continue to go to him for long period of years to learn hadith from him and to memorize hadith from him. 
Muhammad ibn Khalaf al-Taymi rahimahullah he says akhbarana waki qala ataytu al-Amash and this is also an amazing story that gives proof to what we just explained regarding the matter of taking payment over the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to teach it to relate it to narrate it this is a great story between Imam al-Amash and Imam Waqi Imam Waqi he says ataytu al-Amash faqultu haddithni qala masmuk qultu waqi qala ismun ismun nabil ma ahsibu illa sayakun laka naba'an ayna tanzilu min al-kufa qultu fi bani ru'as qala ayna min manzil al-jarrah ibn mali qultu dhaka abi dhaka abi wa kana ala bayt al-mal imam waqi he says i came to al-amash rahimullah for the first time when i came to to hear a hadith from him and to seek hadith from him so he, he said, I came to him and I told him, Hadithni, narrate a hadith to me. Narrate a hadith to me. So Imam Amash, and Imam Amash has great stories. Great stories similar to these stories that show his intelligence, that show uh, his genius. And many of the scholars have collected these stories uh, in which there are great benefits. From, the, from them is this story. He says, so when Waqi ibn Jarrah told him to narrate hadith to him, he said, what is your name? So Imam Waqi said, Waqi. So he said, this is, a, this is a very beautiful name. This is a noble name. And I, I hope and I deem that in the future, you will become noble. You will be someone who is noble in the science of hadith. You will reach a rank that will be a rank of prestige and nobility in the science. Then he asked him, where do you live in Kufa? Or what is your tribe? What is your family? So Imam Waqi said, Bani Ru'as. I'm from the tribe of Ru'as. He is a Ru'asi. So Imam Amash, when he heard this, he said, So where do you live? Or what is your connection and relation to Al-Jarrah ibn Mali? Al-Jarrah ibn Mali, who, is from, who was from the heads of these tribes. So Imam Waqi, he said, Zaka Abi. That is my father. That is my father, Wakana ala bayt al-mal. And he was the one who was responsible uh, uh, over the zakat and the baytul mal in the city of Kufa in the city of Kufa فَقَالَ عَامَشْ اِذْهَبْ فَجِعْنِي بِعَطَاعِي وَتَعَالْ حَتَّى أُحَدِّثَكَ بِخَمْسَةْ أَحَادِيثِ he said when he found out that he is the son of the one who is responsible over the baytul mal the zakat of the city of Kufa and this story is in the city of Kufa both of them are from the Imams of Kufa one from the Imams of the Tabi'in one from the Imams of the Adbar Tabi'in when he found this out he told Waqi Al-Amash told Waqi go to your father and bring me my payment bring me my payment and then I will narrate to you five ahadith I will narrate to you five ahadith if you bring me my payment فَجَيْتُ إِلَىٰ أَبِي فَأَخْبَرْتُهُ قَالَ خُذْ نِصْفَ الْعَطَى وَذْهَبْ فَإِذَا حَدَّثَكَ بِالْخَمْسَ فَخُذْ النِصْفَ الْآخَرْ حَتَّى تَكُونْ عَشْرَ That his father, Rahimullah, Al-Jarrah ibn Mali, when Waqi returned to him, informed him what Amash had said, that bring me my payment so I, can, I, will, in, I will narrate to you five ahadith. His father was also a person of intelligence. He said, just take half of the payment that he demanded, that he asked for, and give him half of the payment so when he narrates to you five ahadith, then tell him, I will not give you the other half until you narrate to me five more ahadith. Until you narrate to me five more ahadith, so you hear instead of five ahadith, ten ahadith in the same payment, with the same payment to gather more ahadith of Imam Amash. And it is well known that Imam Amash, he was asir in riwayah. He was extremely stringent and, and strong and he was very... Uh, he did not used to narrate the ahadith of Prophet ﷺ except rarely, except rarely. He did not used to narrate to everybody in every instance and in, in large numbers. Rather, he was very, very stingy and protective of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So the people, they used to find ways to extract as many ahadith as they could from Imam Amash. فَأَتَيْتُهُ بِنِصْفْ أَطَاعِهِ فَوَضَعُهُ فِي كَفِّهِ وَقَالَ هَكَذَا he says, Waqi, that I came to Al-Amash and I did as my father told me to give him half of his demanded payment. So he said, I came to him and I gave him half of the payment. So he, 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 
put that payment, those coins, in his hand, in his palm, and وَقَالَ حَكَذَا And he pointed like this, where is the remaining payment? Where is the remaining half? ثُمَّ سَكَتَ فَقُلْتُ حَدِّثْنِي فَأَمْلَ عَلَيَّ حَدِيثَيْنِ فَقُلْتُ وَعَدْتَنِي بِخَمْسَ قَالَ فَأَيْنَ الدَّرَاهِمْ كُلُّهَا So, he said, when Amish did this, I remained quiet, and I said, narrate to me. Narrate a hadith to me. So he narrated with only two a hadith. He only narrated, dictated to me two a hadith. So I told him, Waki says, I told Allah Amish, you promised me five a hadith. You promised me that you will narrate to me five a hadith. So Allah Amish said, where are the remaining darahim? Where is, where is the remaining payment? Where are the remaining coins? This shows the genius and the, uh, the intelligence of Imam, Imam al Amish. For then the story continues. أحسب أن أباك أمرك بهذا ولم يدري أن العامش مدرب قد شهد الواقع اذهب فجعني بتمامه So he said I, I, I believe that you have done this out of the guidance of your father He has guided you to do such an act Go back to him, return Bring me by the remaining payment, the other half and I will narrate the remaining ahadith to you from the uh, remaining five فَجِئْتُهُ فَحَدَّثَنِي بِخَمْسَةً فَكَانَ إِذَا كَانَ كُلُّ شَهْرٍ جِئْتُهُ بِعَطَائِهِ فَحَدَّثَنِي بِخَمْسَةً أَحَدِيثِ So he said, I returned back to my father. I came back with the remaining half of the payment. So he completed five ahadith. He narrated the remaining three ahadith to me and he completed five. He said, this was the beginning of my relationship with this great Imam, Imam Al-Amash. He said, then it became a habit of mine that I would go to Imam Suleiman ibn Mihran al-Amash every month, every month with his monthly payment and he would narrate to me every month five ahadith. He would narrate to me every month five ahadith and he continued this, Imam Waki, being patient upon this for years. As he says, اختلفتو للعامش سنين. Years, years until he gathered the ahadith of Imam al-Amash with this difficulty and with this uh, patience. And we will uh, take uh, a break here. Uh, if there are any questions, then uh, you can present them. Chef, uh, you said the scholars have compiled all the stories of Imam al Amish. Is there a book that has all of this? Or? There are books uh, such as Imam al Zahabi has mentioned a lot of them in his seer, seer Alam al Nubula, and some of the contemporaries they have gathered some of the stories and they have published a book by the name Taraif al Amish. Taraif al-Amash, which is a great book in which they have compiled this great, amazing stories of Imam al-Amash uh, that uh, contain great uh, lessons and benefits. And some of them are so, they have humor in them. They have also humor in them uh, that one can uh, benefit from. So we return back to the biography of this great Imam the Imam of the region of Kufa in the era and time of the Sigar Atba Tabi'in, the junior Atba Tabi'in, Imam Waki ibn al Jarrah, Rahimullah. We were discussing some of the life events uh, of this great Imam in which we can take some benefits and reflect upon. From them is the statement of Hussein Akhu Zaydan, he says, Rahimullah. كنت مع وكي فأقبلنا جميعا من المسيسة أو ترسوس فأتينا الشام فما أتينا بلدا إلا استقبلنا واليها وشهدنا الجمعة بدمشق فلما سلم الإمام أطافوا بوكيع فمن صرف إلى أهله يعني إلى الليل قال فحدث به مليحا ابنه فقال رأيت في جسد أبي آثار خضرة مما زحم ذلك اليوم that Hussein he says that I was with Waki and we had just reached Sham the region of Sham from the city of al Masisa, city of Masisa or Tarsus or Tarsus and these two cities today they are close to one another and they fall in the country of Turkey the fall in the country of Turkey, which is to the west, which is to the west of the region of Asham. 
So he says, when we reached Asham, we reached during the time of Jumu'ah in the city of Damascus, the capital of Sham, the city of Damascus, the capital of Sham. So he says that immediately after the Imam, he had given his khutbah and completed the prayer of Jumu'ah, Salatul Jumu'ah, and he said his salam, the people, they, they all gathered around Waqi'ah. They all gathered around Waqi'ah. This shows the great level and the fame that Imam Waqi, he reached in his lifetime, the great status and position he reached uh, in this science, in, in Hadith, and his well-known uh, status in this science all over the world. He said the people gathered around Imam Waqi, فَمَنْ sarafa ila ahlihi ila layl That they did not leave him. They did not leave him except at night when he returned back to his family. This gathering, the people did not leave him, the students of hadith, the students of knowledge, until the night. Until the night. So he, his son, Malih, he says that I saw the, the marks of injury, green injury marks on the body of my father, Waki, from that, that crowd that had gathered around him that day. The people have gathered around him in large crowds in Damascus, the capital of, of Sham, of Syria, to hear a hadith, and they did not leave him until the night, and he was patient, and he uh, stayed with them until the night, and they even caused injury and harm to him, and he had, he had marks of green marks of injuries on his body that shows the great sacrifice that these great Imams, they went through and they bore in order to convey and teach and relate the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abbas al-Duri, rahimahullah, he says, Haddathana Yahya ibn Ma'in, ra'aytu waki'an akhada fi kitab al-zuhud yaqra'ahu, falamma balaga hadithan minhu, taraka al-kitab thumma qama, falam yuhaddith. That Abbas al-Duri, he says that our sheikh and teacher, the great Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, he narrated to us that he was in the gathering of Imam Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah where he was narrating to them his great book, Az-Zuhud. Imam al-Waqi' from the greatest of books that he has authored that we have in our position today, walhamdulillah, is the book Az-Zuhud. Az-Zuhud, in which he has gathered the ahadith and the athar pertaining to Zuhud. And this has been uh, authenticated and verified and published by our great Sheikh. Uh, Dr. Abdurrahman bin Abdul Jabbar Al Farawai Hafidahullah. Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in he says that we were in the gathering where Waki was conveying and relating to us this book, Az Zuhud. So he reached a hadith, he reached a point in this book where he read a hadith, so he stopped dictating this book to us and he got up and he left. He got up and he left and he discontinued the gathering. فَلَمَّا كَانَ مِنَ الْغَدِّ وَأَخَذَ فِيهِ بَلَغَ ذَلِكَ الْمَكَانِ قَامَ أَيْضًا وَلَمْ يُحَدِّثْ حَتَّى سَنَعَ ذَلِكْ سَلَاسَةَ أَيَّامِ That he returned the next day and again started dictating this book as Zuhud to us until he reached the same hadith, the same position and he stopped and he got up and he left and discontinued the gathering. And he did that for a period of three straight days. Three straight days. قُلْتُ لِي يَحْيَى Abbas al-Duri, he said, I asked Yahya ibn Ma'in, وَأَيُّ حَدِيثٍ هُوَ What was this hadith that caused Imam Waqir to stop dictating hadith, to stop this gathering, and to leave this gathering? قَالَ حَدِيثٍ كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ أَوْ عَابِرُ السَّبِيلٌ This hadith, the hadith that caused him to do this three straight days is the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, he said that be in this life, in this worldly life, as if you are a stranger, as if you are a stranger or a wayfarer, someone who is passing by, someone who is passing by. So when Waqi ibn Jarrah, he reached this hadith three straight days, the, the weight of this hadith and pondering and reflection upon this hadith, he caused him to stop narrating and leave the gathering until he could return uh, the next day. Yahya ibn Ayyub, he says, حدثني بعد أصحاب وكيع 
الذين كانوا يلزمونه أن وكيعا كان لا ينام حتى يقرأ جزءه من كل ليلة ثلث القرآن ثم يقوم في آخر الليل فيقرأ المفصل ثم يجلس فيأخذ في الاستغفار حتى يطلع الفجر Dad, Yahya ibn Mayyub, he says that some of the closest students of Waqi who were always with him, they informed me that he used to not sleep at night except that he would re read and recite Thuluth al-Quran, one third of the Quran every night. His habit was to recite, he would not sleep until he recited one third of the Quran. Then after sleeping for a short while, he would get up to pray the Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer. And in this Qiyamul Layl, he would recite the Mufassal. He would recite the Mufassal. Anyone know what the Mufassal are? The Mufassal, they are suwar, chapters of the Quran that have been called Al-Mufassal because of the frequent fasal fusul between these chapters frequent ending of these chapters and frequent statement of bismillah rahman rahim between these chapters between these chapters and the scholars have deferred as to where this suwar and chapters start they have all united that the last of the mufassal is surah nas the last is surah nas but they have deferred as to where they start and the most correct position is that they start from Surat Qaf. Surat Qaf until Surat Al-Nas. From the fifth, fifth chapter, the fifth Surah of the Quran until the last chapter, Surat Al-Nas, the 114th Surah of the Quran. So he used to recite in his night prayer, nightly, daily, Imam Waqi, the Mufassal. The Mufassal. And then he would sit making istighfar asking forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal, seeking repentance until the Adhan of Fajr, until the Adhan of Fajr. Ahmad ibn Sinan, rahimahullah, he says, رَأَيْتُ وَكِيعًا إِذَا قَامَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ لَيْسَ يَتَحَرَّكْ مِنْهُ شَيْءٍ وَلَا يَزُولُ وَلَا يَمِيلُ عَلَى رِجْلٍ دُونَ الْأُخْرَى That he says, I used to see Waki, if he stood in the prayer, then no part of his body it would move, it would move. And he did not, from his prolonged standing in the prayer, he did not used to move his feet. We see people that if they prolong their prayer or the standing in the prayer, then they become tired and they start moving their feet restlessly. Imam Waqir, he used to prolong his standing and he would not move his feet. Salam ibn Junada, he says, Jalas tu waqi'an saba sinin. فما رأيته بزق ولا مس حسات ولا جلس مجلسا فتحرك وما رأيته إلا مستقبل القبلة وما رأيته يحلف بالله. he says سلام ابن جنادا that I sat in the gatherings in the in the companionship of Imam Waki for seven years for seven years I did not see him ever spitting ever spitting and I did not see him ever playing with small pebbles and rocks that used to be present in those times in the masajid and in the houses and in the gatherings. There used to be small rocks and pebbles present. I did not see him playing with the small rocks and pebbles. And I did not see him except facing the Qibla. And I did not see him ever swearing by Allah Azza wa Jal, taking an oath by Allah Azza wa Jal. All of this uh, actions are befitting for a scholar and for a student of knowledge to follow as an example to the people. He should not be a person like the general layman people spitting uh, in front of the people on the on the streets in the on the ways and playing with rocks and pebbles and things that are funeral and of no benefit. Playing with rocks and pebbles has come in a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned that the one who plays with rocks and pebbles while listening to the khatib during the khutbah of the Juma, then he has laga, that he has spoken. Playing with these rocks and pebbles, it is equal to speaking during the khutbah and his reward of attending that khutbah and Juma has been lost, has been lost. 
from them is he did not used to swear and take an oath of Allah Azza wa Jal. Today we see that one of the common phenomena is that the people are the most lax in saying Wallahi. In saying Wallahi. Uh, they swear by the least, in the least of affairs, in the smallest uh, of affairs, uh, uh, tens and hundreds of times with this great statement of swearing and taking an oath by Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Ta'ala, He says in the Quran, وَلَا تَجْعَلُوا اللَّهَ عُرْضَةً لِأَيْمَانِكُمْ That do not take Allah Azza wa Jal and His word as something to be played around in your oaths and in your uh, uh, promises and in your swearing. Allah Azza wa Jal, He also says, وَحْفَظُوا أَيْمَانَكُمْ That preserve your oaths, safeguard your oaths and swearing. This is a very serious matter. A person who swears, there is expectation upon this swearing. It might lead him to something that is sinful. It might lead him to something that is Unt unt uh, un uh, is something that is not truthful, something that is a lie. Saeed ibn Ufair he says, Akhbarani Rajulun min ahli hadha shan thika min ahl murua wal adab kala ja Rajulun ila waki ibn jarrah fakala lahu inni umuttu ilayka bi hurma kala wa ma hurmatuk kala kunta taktubu min mehbarati fi majlis al amash. That one of the people, they came to, he came to Waki ibn Jarrah and he says, Verily, I have something that you owe me. I have something that is owed to me from you. So he asked him, Wama hurmatuk. What is that that I owed, owe you? What is that that I owe you? So he told him that you used to write by using my ink pot in the gathering of Al Amash. Sulaiman ibn Mihran, Al Amash. When your ink would run out or it would diminish, you would use my ink pot just to refill your ink uh, to write in the gathering of Al Amash. Qala fa wasaba waki fa dakhala manzilahu fa akhraja lahu surra fiha dananir fa qala izirni fa inni ma amliku ghair haza fa ata kulla ma indahu min al mal. That Waki ibn al Jarrah, upon hearing this, that this person has a right over him. He owes something to him. He immediately entered his residence and he brought back to him a, a, a pouch that contained the nanir, that contained the nanir, gold coins. And he sought forgiveness from him and he says, Azirni, excuse me, I do not possess anything other than this. He handed him these gold coins saying, I do not possess anything other than this. He gave him everything that he possessed from, from wealth. He gave him everything that he possessed from wealth due to this person claiming that he has a right over him. He owes, he has something that Waki ibn Jarrah owes him. Yahya ibn Aksam, he says, Sahibtu Waki an fil hadari was safar wa kana yasoom ad-dahar وَيَخْتِمُ الْقُرْآنَ كُلَّ لَيْلَةِ Yahya ibn Aksam, he says that I traveled and I stayed in the companionship of Waki in his residence and during his travels. I stayed with him in his uh, companionship in, in his residence and I traveled with him. He used to fast at dahar He used to fast every single day. He used to fast every single day and he used to finish the Qur'an every single night. He used to recite the complete Qur'an every single night. Imam al-Zahabi, when he narrated this statement in his great book, Seer Alam al nubula this great book, Seer Alam al nubula that is not just a book of gathering biographies, Imam al-Zahabi has these great notes and explanations and comments that he writes that one uh, can benefit from and is full of knowledge. He says when he narrates this statement, هَذِهِ عِبَادَةٌ يُخْدَعُ لَهَا وَلَكِنَّهَا مِنْ مِثْلِ إِمَامٍ مِنْ أَئِمَّةِ الْأَثَرِيَّةِ مَفْضُولَةِ فَقَدْ صَحَّ نَهِيهُ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَنْ سَوْمَ الدَّهَرِ وَصَحَّ أَنَّهُ نَهَى أَنْ يُقْرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ فِي أَقَلْ مِنْ ثَلَاثِ وَالدِّينُ يُسُرْ وَمُتَابَعَةُ السُّنَّةِ أَوْلَى فَرَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ وَكِيهِ وَأَيْنَ مِثْلُ وَكِيهِ He says that after narrating his statement that Waki ibn al-Jarrah he used to fast every single day 
and he used to recite the entire Quran every single night in the night prayer. He says, this is worship that is that one can take benefit from, that one can reflect upon, that one can reflect upon and ponder and appreciate. But, he says, وَلَكِنَّهَا But from one of the Imams, من الأئمة الأثرية, the Imams of the Asar, the Imams of the Ahlul Hadith, then it is not befitting for him. It is not befitting for him, for rarely it has been authentically established on Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that he forbade fasting every single day. He forbade fasting every single day. As has come in authentic hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said that the best of fasting that he allowed is Psalm Dawood, the fasting of Dawood, which was to fast every other day. Every other day. And Imam Zahabi continues by saying, also it has come in authentic hadith that the Prophet وسلم, forbade to complete the Quran in less than three days. To complete the Quran in less than three days. Then he says, what dinu yusur. The religion of Islam is a religion of ease. It's a religion of ease. Wa mutaba to sunnah awla. And following the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, it takes precedence. It is an example. That is what one should follow and take as an example. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with Imam Waqi. Fa radiallahu an waqi. Wa ayna mithlu waqi. And where do we find anyone similar to Imam Waqi? Where we will find anyone similar to Imam Waqi? Then he continues. Wa kullu ahadin yukhad min qawlihi wa yutrat. That everyone's statement and action can be taken and can be left off except the statement and action of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in this we find the great benefit that these statements that are mentioned on great Imams that they prayed every single night the entire Quran or they uh, fasted every single day or they prayed uh, with a single wudu, the Fajr prayer the, uh, they prayed with the same wudu from Isha until Fajr for 40 years. 40 years and long periods of time first of all they have to be authentically established on them. Many of these narrations are not authentically established. Many of these narrations are not authentically established. It is from people who have uh, fabricated them or made mistakes and errors in these narrations. And if, from those that are established, such as this, has been established on Imam Waqi, that he used to fast every single day, and that he used to pray and finish the entire Quran every single night. So the answer is that the example that whose statements and actions are to be followed are Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam From With this we have finished looking at some aspects of the life of this great Imam and some life events of this great Imam from which allowed us to reflect upon them and take benefit then we move on to the next topic that we always discuss, which is the aqidah, the etiqad, the creed, the belief system of this great imam and his position regarding innovations and misguidance and the people of innovation and misguidance. And as we always reiterate, that this is the position of all of these great imams of the salaf. They are all united unanimously on these matters of creed, their, their belief in creed, their belief in the Quran and the Sunnah, they're the same. There's no difference amongst them. From that is that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimullah, he says, حَدَّثَنَا وَكِيعٌ بِحَدِيثٍ فِي الْكُرْسِ قَالَ فَكْشَعَرَّ رَجُلٌ عِنْدَ وَكِي فَغَضِبَ وَقَالَ أَدْرَكْنَا الْعَامَشْ وَالثَّوْرِ يُحَدِّثُونَ بِحَذِ الْحَدِيثِ وَلَا يُنْكِرُونَهَا That Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal says, I was in the gathering of Imam Waki, where he narrated the hadith of the Kursi. The kursi, the footstool of Allah Azza wa Jal. The footstool of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he said, we saw in the gathering that one of the people, he became extremely displeased. He became extremely displeased hearing this hadith. So Imam Waqi got extremely angry. Got extremely angry and he says, Really, we have met the great scholars of Islam from his teachers, Adrakna al-Amash, Imam al-Amash and Sufyan al-Thawri, they used to narrate this ahadith and they did not used to deny this ahadith. These ahadith of the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, they used to narrate them, believe with them according to their apparent meanings. And they did not used to negate them. They did not used to deny them. Waki rahimallah also says, Nusallimu hazil ahadith kama jaat, wala naqulu kaifa kaza, 
ولا لما كذا يعني مثل حديث يحمل السماوات على اصبع that وكي هي سيز that we accept and believe in the ahadith regarding the attributes and sifat of Allah عز وجل as they have come with their apparent meanings and we do not say how كيف how is this attribute how is this attribute wa wala lima kaza and why we do not say why and how we believe in them we accept them in their apparent meanings as they have been narrated and come to us and he mentioned from them is this hadith that Allah Ta'ala on the day of judgment he will hold and raise the seven heavens on one of his fingers on one of his fingers waki ibn al-jarrah he says idha su'iltum hal yadhak Rabbuna faqulu kathalika sami'na That he said if the people of innovation and misguidance from the Jahmiya Those people who negate the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal If they were to ask you, he's advising his students from the Ahlul Hadith If they were to ask you, if does Allah Ta'ala laugh Does he laugh? Faqulu kathalika sami'na That yes Allah Ta'ala laughs because this has been narrated to us in the In the Quran and the Sunnah, this has come in the proofs and we believe in it. Waqir ibn al Jarrah he says, Ahlu Sunnati Yakulun al Imanu Kaulun wa Amal, wal Murjiya Yakul al Imanu Kaulun bila Amal, wal Jahmiya to Yakulun al Imanu al Marifa. He says that the belief, the correct belief, the belief of Ahlu Sunnah, Ahlu Hadith, the safe sect and the aided group. Regarding Iman, faith, is that it is speech and action. It is speech and action. There are two groups who have opposed the Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Hadith in this belief. The people of innovation and misguidance from them is the Murjiya. The Murjiya, he says that they believe that Iman, faith, is just speech without action. Iman is just speech without action. Then he says the second group is al Jahmiya. The Jahmiya, they believe that Iman is not action and not even speech. It is just something that a person knows in his heart. It is something that he knows in his heart, thereby refuting these two misguided groups in this aspect of Iman and faith. Uthman ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Shayba, rahimahullah, he says, سَأَلْتُ ibn Idris wa Jariran wa Waki'an فَقَالُوا الْإِيمَانُ يَزِيدُ وَيَنْقُسْ He says that I asked Ibn Idris, who is Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, and Jarir and Waqi' so all of them unanimously said they all agreed that Iman faith increases and decreases increases and decreases as we mentioned that all of the scholars of the Salaf they are united in these matters of creed there's no difference amongst them in these matters of creed then we move on to the next topic that we discuss which is the Ittiba him unconditionally following the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in matters of jurisprudence in acts of worship him unconditionally following the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in these matters Ibn Ammar Rahimullah he says مَا كَانَ بِالْكُوفَ فِي زَمَانِ وَكِي أَفْقَهُ وَلَا أَعْلَمُ بِالْحَدِيثِ مِنْ وَكِي that in the era and the time of Waki there was no one in the region of Kufa who was more knowledgeable of jurisprudence of matters of Sharia of rulings of Islam than Waqi' than Waqi' and he combined this with what? where was his jurisprudence derived from? وَلَا أَعْلَمُ بِالْحَدِيثِ مِنْ Waqi' that no one had more knowledge of Hadith the authentic from the unauthentic and the narrative of Hadith than Waqi' than Waqi' his jurisprudence his fiqh was based and derived on this knowledge of the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Waqi' rahimahullah he says مَنْ تَلَبَ الْحَدِيثَ كَمَا جَاءَ فَهُوَ صَاحِبُ السُنَّةِ وَمَنْ طَلَبَهُ لِيُقَوِّيَ بِهِ رَأْيَهُ فَهُوَ صَاحِبُ بِدْعَةٍ He says that whoever seeks the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam to follow it as, as it has come, to follow it unconditionally, wherever the hadith leads him, if it is authentic, then he is the person of sunnah. He is from the safe sect. He is from the aided group. And whoever seeks hadith so as to twist it and conform it to his personal position and his statement and his fatwa and his ruling فَهُوَ sahibu bid'ah. then he is a person of innovation he is a person of innovation the people of sunnah, the people of hadith, the ahlul hadith, ahlul sunnah the safe sect, the aided group they follow the hadith unconditionally they make their positions 
under the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wherever the hadith leads them, they go. As far as the people of innovation, then they use the hadith as something to aid their personal positions. So they twist them, they turn them, they accept from the sunnah what they want, and they reject from the sunnah what they want, and they interpret, in, interpret the sunnah how they want in, uh, in order to strengthen their personal position and their uh, statements. Imam Al-Tirmizi, in his great book, Al-Sunan, Al-Jami', he has narrated this great uh, statement of Imam al waqi which is a, a, a great statement for all of us to ponder. He narrates the hadith on Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, in which he says that, Anna al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qallada na'alayn wa ash'ara al-hadi fi al-shiqq al-ayman bi zil hulayfa wa amata anhu al-dam. That, he says, that I witnessed the Prophet sallallahu in his one and only hajj, hajjatul wada'a. In the 10th year after the hijrah, I witnessed, Abdullah ibn Abbas says, that the Prophet sallallahu in his sacrificial animal, the, the camel that he took as a sacrifice in his hadith, he did two things to it. In the miqat of Medina, Zul Hulayfa. At the miqat of Medina, Zul Hulayfa, where a person enters into the state of ihram. He said he, does, he did two things. The first is he did taqlid of it. He wrapped something around its neck. He, he wrapped something around its neck to differentiate this animal from the other riding animals to show that this is an animal of slaughter during the Hajj. The second thing he did is that Al-Ish'ar Al-Ish'ar on the right side of the camel. Al-Ish'ar is to slit or to puncture the hump of a camel that causes it to bleed a little. That causes it to bleed a little. So the Prophet ﷺ punctured or slit the right side of the hump of this camel and caused some blood to come out to, sh to use this as a sign that this is an animal that is to be slaughtered in Mecca during the Hajj to differentiate from the other animals. Imam Al-Tirmizi, after narrating this hadith, he continues in his book as Jamia Sunan, he's saying, he says, Sameetu Yusuf ibn Isa yaqul, Sameetu waqiyan yaqul hina rawa hadha al-hadith, faqala, la tanzuru ila qawl ahli al-ray fi hadha, fa inna al-ish'ara sunna wa qawluhum bid'a. Imam Waqi' this hadith has been narrated by Imam Al-Tirmizi from the chain of narration of Imam Waqi' he heard it from his sheikh who heard it from Waqi' who heard it from his sheikh until it reached Abdullah ibn Abbas who heard it from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when Imam Waqi' he narrated this hadith he said that do not pay attention do not give any importance and position to the statement of the Ahlul Rai the Ahlul Rai the Hanafis the people of analogy, because their position, their position, the Hanafi position, is that the ishar to slit and to puncture the animal. This is this is an innovation. This is an innovation. So he says, do not pay any attention, do not give any importance to their statement. For inna al sunnah, for ishar to puncture and to slit the sacrificial animal as a sign to differentiate from other animals. This is the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad And the statement of the Ahlul Rai, the Hanafis, for who, forbid, who forbid this, then they are, this, it is an innovation. It is an innovation. Imam At-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, continues by saying, وَسَمَيْتُ أَبَا السَّائِبِ يَقُولْ كُنَّا عِنْدَ وَكِيعٍ فَقَالَ لِرَجُلٍ عِنْدَهُ مِمَّنْ يَنْظُرُ فِي الرَّاي أَشَعَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَيَقُولُ أَبُو حَنِيفَ هُوَ مُثْلَى قَالَ الرَّجُلُ فَإِنَّهُ قَدْ رُوِيَانْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ النَّخْعِي أَنَّهُ قَالْ الْإِشَارُ مُثْلَى قَالَ فَرَأَيْتُ وَكِيعًا غَدِبًا غَدَبًا شَدِيدًا وَقَالَ أَقُولُ لَكَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَتَقُولُ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيم That he says, Imam Al-Tirmizi narrates from Abu Sa'ib Rahimullah that he said, we were in the gathering of Waqir. We were in the gathering of Waqir. So one of the people of the Ahlul Rai, one of the people of the Ahlul Rai, the Hanafis, who was in this gathering, he, Imam Waqi, directed his speech to him and he said that, 
The Prophet وسلم, he performed al -ishar. He performed this act of slitting or puncturing the side of an sacrificial animal to distinguish it from others. And the Prophet وسلم, performed this action and Abu Hanifa, he says that this is musla, that this is something that is uh, to make an example of that Islam has prohibited. Islam, from the rulings of Islam that have come in the Quran and the Sunnah, is that to uh, make an example of, of something that is dead, something that has passed away, it is not permissible. This is called musla, to make an example of something that is passed away, to use, use it, to change its appearance, to, to make it an, an example. This is musla. So he says that the Prophet ﷺ, he did ishar and Abu Hanifa, he considers this as musla. He considers this to make this slit or to make this puncture in the animal's uh, hump, the camel's hump, he considers this to be musla. And considers this to be making an example of someone who is dead. فَقَالَ الرَّجُلُ When Waki said the statement to this Hanafi, the person of Ahlul Rai, he says, فَإِنَّهُ قَدْ رُوِيَ عَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ النَّخَعِ أَنَّهُ قَالَ الْإِشْعَارُ مُثْلَ That really we have a proof. We have a proof for this position. And what is your proof? That Ibrahim al-Nakhai, rahimahullah, from the Tabi'een, from the Tabi'een, he said that al-Ish'aru musla, that this practice of Ish'ar, to slit and puncture the animal, this is musla. This is to make an example of it. فَرَأَيْتُ وَكِيعًا غَدِبَ غَدَبًا شَدِيدًا So Abu Sa'ib, he said, I saw that Waki became extremely angry. When he heard this, extremely angry, he said, "Aqulu laka kala Rasulullahi sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa taqulu kala Ibrahim." That I am narrating to you a hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and did such and such, and you tell me that Ibrahim says such and such. You tell me that Ibrahim and Nakhai did such and such. Ma ahqqa bi an tuhbas, thumma la tahruj hatta tanzi an qawlika haza. He says that it is deserving that you are imprisoned and that you are jailed. It is deserving that you're imprisoned and that you're jailed and you are not given freedom. You are not let out of this prison and jail until you retract this statement, until you retract this position. Yazid ibn Abdu, Yazid ibn Abdi Rabbi, he says, Sameetu Waki ibn al-Jarrah, yaqulu li Yahya ibn Saleh al-Wahadi, ya Aba Zakariya, ihzir al-Rai. That, he says, I heard Waki ibn al-Jarrah telling Yahya ibn Saleh Al Wahadi, that O oh, Abu Zakaria, that was his kunya. Beware of a rai, beware of personal positions and judgments and fatawa and uh, statements in opposition to the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad. Ali ibn Khashram, he says, Sameetu waki an yakulu li ashab al hadith, law annakum tafakahtum al hadith, wa ta'alam tumuhu, ma galabakum ashab al rai. مَا قَالَ أَبُوْ حَنِيفَ فِي شَيْءٍ يُحْتَاجُ إِلَيْهِ إِلَّا وَنَحْنُ نَرْوِي فِيهِ بَابًا Waki ibn al-Jarrah, he advised his students, the students of hadith, the Ahlul Hadith, by saying that if you were to exert yourself and derive fiqh and jurisprudence from the hadith of Prophet Muhammad wasallam that you have in your position and memory, then you wouldn't have no need for the Ahlul Rai. You would have no need for the Hanafis and this Madrasa, the school of thought that is in opposition to the Ahlul Hadith, that is in opposition to the Ahlul Hadith, in which rulings are derived from, from the fatawa and the statements and, and qiyas of, the, of their school of thought, or the imams of their school of thought, Imam Abu Hanifa and his students. He said, if you were to exert yourself and derive rulings and gain the knowledge of this from the Ahadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you would have no need for the people of uh, 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 the Ahlul Rai. And he says that Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimullah, he has not ruled and he does not have a Rai, a position, a fatwa, a statement in any matter from the matters of the religion that we need except that we have not just a single Hadith, Narwi Fihi Baban. We have several ahadith. We have a complete chapter of ahadith that we have we narrate in those matters. That we narrate in those matters, meaning that everything has come in the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he directed his students to gain fiqh and understanding of the Sunnah to derive rulings from it.
Then we move on to some of the statements of this great Imam in which we can take benefit and reflect and ponder upon. He says, Imam Waqi' rahimullah, لَوْ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ الصَّلَاةَ أَفْضَلُ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ مَا حَدَّثْتُكُمْ He says that if I knew, if, if the knowledge I possessed, it directed me to this position that the prayer, the salah, the prayer, the salah is better than the knowledge of hadith, then I would have not narrated any hadith to you. That I would have not narrated any hadith to you. This gives proof to the position of the scholars that the most virtuous of the non-obligatory deeds, the most virtuous of the deeds after the the deeds that Allah Ta'ala has obligated upon the Muslim is to seek knowledge. The most virtuous of the deeds after the obligatory deeds is seeking knowledge. Here Imam Waqi says that if voluntary prayers, if voluntary prayers, if I, if I knew, if my knowledge led me to this position that voluntary prayers were better than conveying knowledge, than teaching, than narrating hadith, then I would have never narrated anything to you. I would be busy with my voluntary prayers. But his knowledge led him to this fact that teaching and not seeking knowledge, uh, the knowledge of hadith, it is better than voluntary prayers. Waqi ibn al-Jarrah rahimahullah, he says, مَنْ لَمْ يَأْخُذْ أُحْبَ أُحْبَةَ السَّلَاةِ قَبْلَ وَقْتِهَا لَمْ يَكُنْ وَقَّرَهَا He says that whoever does not take the means and preparations for the prayer, for the salah, before its time, before the, the time of the prayer enters, before the time of any single prayer enters, then he has not respected that prayer. Then he has not given respect to that prayer. Imam Waqi also says, Man tahawana ula faghsil yadayka minhu That whoever you see, he is lax in coming early to the prayer, to the salah, and he is not keen in in reaching the the takbiratul ihram which opens the prayer if he's late to the prayer if he's always late and he's lax in this he's lazy in this then have wash your hands from this person there's no goodness in such a person who is lax and lazy regarding his prayers regarding his prayers kala waqi also rahimullah he says innam al aqilu man aqala an illah amrahu wa laysa man aqala amra dunyahu he says that the intelligent person, who is the intelligent person? He is the one who, who understands, who understands the hereafter, who understands the affairs of the hereafter. And he is not the one who understands the affairs of this worldly life. The person who is intelligent, who is truly intelligent, he is the one who understands the affairs of the hereafter. Not the one who understands the affairs of this worldly life. Waqi rahimullah he also says هَذِهِ بِدَاعَةٌ لَا يَرْتَفِعُ فِيهَا إِلَّا صادق. That this trade he is referring to the seeking of knowledge the seeking of knowledge he is saying this trade that no one raises and prospers in this trade except for the one who is truthful except for the one who is truthful we, t we benefit from this that the way of reaching salvation by way of seeking knowledge is to have ikhlas, is to have a pure, sincere intention to seek it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal alone, not for the sake of any worldly benefit, any worldly benefit from position and fame and other than them. This such a person will be raised by Allah Azza wa Jal in rank in this world and in the hereafter. In this world and in the hereafter. Waqi Rahimullah also says, La yakmulul rajulu hatta yaktuba amman huwa fawqahu wa amman huwa mithlahu wa amman huwa dunahu. He says that a person, he is not complete, a student of knowledge, he is not complete until he seeks knowledge and writes hadith from three types of people. From three types of people. From, the, from those who are higher than him in knowledge. Who are higher than him greater than him in knowledge and from the one, the second person who is similar to him in knowledge and the third person who is lesser than him in knowledge, who is lesser than him in knowledge. Showing that this was a methodology of these great scholars of hadith that it did not shyness, did not sh stop them. They were simple, 
they had the simplicity that they used to hear and learn a hadith even from their students, even from those who were younger than them, if they had a hadith that they did not have in their possession, if they had some part of knowledge that they did not have in their possession. And we have mentioned this over and over, that many of the students of these scholars are some of the teachers, some of the teachers, them reaching this high status and this position, that position and that shame did not stop him, did not stop them from seeking knowledge from those who were lesser than them in knowledge. Uh, and this is the proper methodology of seeking knowledge that a person does not have pride, does not deem that he is above knowledge and above uh, others and he has reached a point that there's no need for him to now continue in seeking knowledge and he knows everything. Rather, the scholars, they continued until their death, seeking knowledge from whoever, even if he was lesser than him, if he had some beneficial knowledge that they did not have. We will conclude by speaking on the final point, which is the death of this great Imam, Imam Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah, rahimahullah. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, from the foremost students of Imam Waqi', he says, Hajja Waqi', Hajja Waqi'un, sanata sittin wa tis'in wa mata bi fayd. He says that Imam Waqi' he made the Hajj, he made the Hajj in the year 196, 196, and when returning from this journey of Hajj from Mecca, he passed away in the in the, in a small city in a small place called Faid, Faid, and this is a city today between Mecca and Kufa, between Mecca and Kufa, he passed away while returning from this journey of Hajj. Abu Hisham al-Rifai, rahimahullah, he says, Mata waki'un sanata sab'in wa tis'in wa mia yawm ashura fadufina bifayd. Ay, raji'an min al-Hajj. Abu Hisham al-Rifai, he says, Waki ibn al-Jarrah, rahimahullah, he passed away in the year 197. He passed away in the year 197, and he passed away in on the day of Ashura, the day of Ashura, which was coincidentally yesterday. It was yesterday, the day of Ashura, and he was buried in the city of Faid, which is between Mecca and Kufa, while returning from this journey of Hajj. Imam Zahabi, rahimullah, he says, Asha Samani and was sitting a sana, siwa shahran or shahrain, that he lived for a period of 68 years. 68 years, except for a month or two months. He did not reach 60 years, 68 years of age. He passed away before that by a month or Two months for Rahimahullah, Al Imam Waki, Rahmatan Wasia, Wazahu Anil Islami, Wal Muslimina, Khair al Jaza. And we'll take a break here. If there are any questions, then we can address them. Sheikh, uh, about the, like him praying uh, or him fasting every day and finishing the Quran uh, every day, can you say that maybe that hadith didn't reach him at this time? I mean, we don't know the reasons. It could be that the hadith did not reach him or he did not deem it to be authentic. It did not reach him with an authentic chain. The hadith that he gathered in this topic, he did not hear it from reliable, trustworthy narrators. Or he, he maybe viewed these hadith to be something that is, uh, uh, something that is disliked for the one who is not able to do such an action or who is not able to be patient upon this fasting daily and this prayer nightly, uh, reciting the Quran. And these kind of statements are well known on the scholars of Islam. Uh, and as we mentioned, first step of action is to establish the statements, if it is true on them or not, if they really did this or not. And once it is established, then no matter what the reason is, the conclusion is, as Imam al Dhahabi has said, that the only example who is to be followed is the Prophet Muhammad. Wasallam. everyone's actions and statements can be accepted and they can be left off except the actions and statements of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No. This is authentic hadith this is authentic hadith that on the day of judgment Allah Ta'ala will put the seven heavens on one finger and the seven earths on one finger. And there are many ahadith that have come with uh, establishing this 
attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal that he has fingers. That he has fingers. From them is the hadith that the hearts of the people are between the two fingers of Allah Azza wa Jal, of Ar Rahman. And he changes them and he turns them however he wills. However he wills. These ahadith regarding the attributes, the sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal, then we are to believe in them in their apparent meanings. The word usbu, asabi, in the Arabic language, they have a meaning. The people of the Arabic language understand this. If you translate it into the other languages, then they have a meaning, which is fingers. As to how these fingers are, then this is not something that we have knowledge of. How these fingers are, this is not something that we have knowledge of. And the Quran and Sunnah have established that لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ shay That Allah Ta'ala, there is no resemblance to Him. There is no resemblance to Him. But how these fingers are, we have no knowledge of it. And to ask about them or to delve into this is a matter of innovation. It is a sign of the people of innovation. But to affirm these attributes in their apparent meanings, this is the methodology of the Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Hadith, the safe sect and the aided group. The people of innovation, they are the ones who distort the meanings. So they say the finger here, no, it means that Allah Ta'ala will hold the seven heavens by His power by his mercy or they distort it or they outright reject it and deny these attributes saying this this is a word usbo asabe finger that has no meaning this is a word that has no meaning we do not know what this means this is a position of innovation that the scholars of the salaf have all united against the words have meanings we affirm the meanings the ma'na is ma'loom the meaning is known but the kayf the kayfiya the how is unknown how is unknown now? During the wudu, you mentioned that during the winter time here, uh, we have like Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, all together and going to the work. Sometimes we want to keep the wudu because of the difficulty of getting the wudu done. So can we keep it throughout the day? I mean, this was not the point that was mentioned. Uh, the point was that uh, some narrations have come or stories regarding some of the Imams that show their great exertion in worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. That they would make wudu and pray Isha, Isha, and then they would pray Fajr with the same wudu, with the same wudu for a period of 40 years. For a poor 40 years. Meaning that they did not sleep for a single second between Isha and Fajr for 40 years. Because sleep is something that breaks a person's wudu. So these statements are narrated to show the great exertion of these Imams in their worship. In their worship. The matter of discussion was not if one can pray the salawat with the same wudu. One can pray multiple salawat with the same wudu. Of course, this is permissible. Of course, this is permissible. No. Yeah. 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 So, um, you, you, you said about one book which is Azur, which is uh, verified and published by uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman uh, Al Farewai. But are there any other books of Imam Waki or no? I mean, this is the most well-known book. He must have some ajza, some small collections of ahadith, etc., that might have been published. But this is the largest and well-known book of Imam al-Waqi, al-Zuhud. Barakallah.